And I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a community in Washington of enormous caliber, interest, diversity that I probably would never have a chance to meet. And so you are having a chance to experience living in Pennsylvania. And I welcome you all, and I will simply say a very brief word about the panelists, who I know need no introduction, but certainly deserve one. Uh, the, uh, to my right here is Sterling Brown, who is a poet, uh, a critic, a historian, a professor, uh, you name it, he is it. <laughs> there is almost nothing. <laughs> And next to, uh, next to uh, Professor Brown, we have the baby of the group, <laughs> the youngster. Um, this is Dr. Montague Cobb, who is an anthropologist, a physician, uh, a scholar, uh, the present president of the NAACP. Uh, he has, in addition to his medical degree, he has a PhD. Uh, the number of degrees that are represented and honors that are represented by this panel, I could not possibly take the time to go into. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Cobb is Dr. Rayford Logan, who is a historian, a writer, who as a matter of fact is having a new book come out uh, within the next few months. And Dr. Logan is the senior member of the panel. And he is also a Spingarn medalist uh, and we are extraordinarily lucky to have him here. Next to Dr. Logan is uh, our, our what, what is it, our tribute to women's lib. <laughs> May Miller, who is a poet, a playwright, who wrote plays way back under Montgomery Gregory and Alain Locke when they were at, uh, at Howard. See, I almost said Harvard. <laughs> the Negro Harvard. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, May also is having a new book coming out. And actually, Sterling's, new, Sterling's collected works has just come out, as a matter of fact. And I'm sure Dr. Cobb has either a book or article or something coming out. Uh, and uh, on the, uh, the, mod the discussant of this panel is Karen Hasty Williams. Uh, and Karen comes uh, with quite forbearers herself. She's a lawyer herself. She's uh, an extraordinary person. She is um, also uh, the daughter of Judge William Hasty. And wherein lies the tale? <laughs> uh, it is a great pleasure and an honor for me to serve as the moderator of this panel today talking about reminiscences of life in segregated Washington. Having had the privilege of knowing many members of this panel for more years than I can remember, in fact, Monty Cobb knew me before I knew myself, uh, it will be a real opportunity to relive some of the experiences with them that were the foundations on which my generation built and hopefully will pass on to our children the strength, the integrity, the excellence that they represented and continue to represent. We'd like to follow a format to give each one of the panelists an opportunity to share with us his or her thoughts about life in Washington and then following that open it up for a general discussion and questions from the audience. Let me say that each one of these panelists could speak for at least a month on their experiences. So this is going to be very difficult for them and for me to try and keep them to a 15 minute time frame. Uh, there are other panels going on this afternoon, and I know you all want to get the, the full experience. But I'll ask Dr. Brown to start off for us, and we'll see uh, how quickly we can move through the panel. And I hope up front let me ask them to excuse me if I have to gently remind them that we must move on to the next panelist. Dr. Brown?
I was hoping that my mentor would start us off, uh, and that's Dr. Rayford Logan, but I obey orders. <laughs> I think I have 15 minutes. On May 1st, I'll be 80 years old. If I give one minute to one year, I'll be right young when I get through. So I won't do that. I didn't know about the time span. At my age, of the rule it to 15 minutes, it takes me that to say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> and if I add anything to it, such as how are you, there goes another half hour. Uh, segregation was, of course, a disgrace to any ideals of democracy. And George Washington Cable, one of the rare Southern liberals after the Civil War, had a character speak about segregation. Somebody said, it is to keep the races separate. And Madame Delphine said, no, it is not to keep the races separate, but to keep us despised. That might have been the purpose. As far as I was concerned, and as far as my buddies were concerned, and as far as our parents were concerned, we were not despicable. We were not to be despised. There was definite separation. There was definite segregation in Washington. Everything was segregated, I said the other day. Thank you. You know, I don't believe in these things. When I was a boy in Washington, we did not have these technological adventures. Uh, we trained the wares so the wares could get in the back of the room. Way! So, Dr. Logan, am I being ridiculous? <laughs> Uh, so in Washington, uh, we were segregated, and I said the other day, everything except uh, transportation, uh, certainly restaurants, certainly theaters, uh, no, not trains uh, going from Washington to Baltimore, but trains going from Washington to Alexandria were, of course, segregated. Uh, there were, I think, there was one place where we could... Uh, uh, eat in the same place with uh, caucasoids, and that would be the Union Station. But who could afford the Union Station except uh, Dr. Carter Woodson and Dr. Alain Locke? You, you did not need a PhD uh, to eat in the station, but you needed a certain number, number of greenbacks. At any rate, uh, we had such great restaurants as uh, Harrison's, which was the uh, meeting place of the Howard University faculty when I came here. And, uh, but by and large, theaters, everything was segregated, except I remembered in my working over this talk, the real stadium was not segregated. We could go to the ball games. Uh, generally, we were selling soda pop, but sometimes we could go there. And I used to go there frequently because I wanted a full liberal education. And uh, most of us sat out in the right field beaches, not by force, but just by... Uh, the fact that we knew each other and made a few bets on whether Walter Johnson would strike out three or four. Now, the school system was segregated, but the school system in Washington was an excellent one. I went to Garnet Patterson, Lucretia Mott, M Street, and Dunbar. One of the things I've noticed is that in Washington, the schools were named after important figures in the abolitionist movement or in the struggle for civil rights. When I lived in Froggy Bottom at 11th and R Street, the Lincoln Temple Memorial Congregational Church had a parsonage up there. I lived at 11th and R, first 10 years of my life, 
And two blocks away was the Garrison High School after William Lloyd Garrison. I went to the Garnett Patterson after Henry Highland Garnett, Patterson, another important abolitionist. Went to Dunbar, named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar. There I had excellent teachers. I remember one graded school teacher named Miss Mall, and I found out later that she was the daughter of the man rescued by Harriet Tubman in Auburn, New York, Charles Nall. And I remember her vividly. I did not know that about at that, that time. I had an excellent principal at Patterson named Alfred Lewis. His impress was strong. At the Cushamont, I studied under the great Miss Casey Lewis. Miss Casey Lewis was a woman of substantial proportion. <laughs> she wore tennis shoes, not in the modern way, but I think to get around fast. And she could move fast. And vindictively, when you were about to throw that crayon, she had left the room. She'd come in the cloakroom and bat you across your head. But she also taught poetry. She was an excellent elocutionist, an excellent reader of poetry. She was a great teacher. She was a great lady. She was a wonderful lady. When I went to M Street, you see, I'll take all this time just giving a catalog of the teachers because almost all of them were first rate. I know Monty will add to some of them, but at M Street we had, and, and, and Dunbar, M Street, Dunbar, Armstrong were excellent schools. And this nonsense of setting up Armstrong against Dunbar, we saw them on the football field and basketball field. We fought them in the drill, but we respected them. And nobody can tell me that Armstrong did not have a high level of teaching and a high level of achievement by the students. A long time before Dunbar can get a Duke Ellington or a Madame Ivante, but we got plenty. The teachers at Dunbar, how, how about the time? Right. Fourteen minutes gone? Right. Uh, one man <coughs> uh, at, at, at Dunbar, at M Street and Dunbar, would be, I, I can't get his first name right, but it's A-M-P-H something, but his last M name was Glenn. I know, but you, I looked him up, and both of you, you differ on that. I'm a research man. <laughs> now, at any rate, he was a wonderful guy. He was, wonderful. He was from Oberlin. Garnett Wilkinson was from Oberlin. Anna Kuppel, who taught me Latin and who is being celebrated now at the uh, Anacostia Museum. Anna J. Kuppel taught me Latin, taught me Caesar. I divided it all into them three parts. I mean, I was a, I was, I was a word in Latin. I, I just loved language. I could do amo, amas, amas, you know, real fast. <laughs> Take high course, who you of course, you know. Uh, she taught me Latin. Jesse Fawcett taught me uh, French and Latin. Jesse Fawcett taught third year Latin. She also taught me French, but she caused me to go into Williams College with a condition in French. Because she said to me, Sterling, pronounce mm, one, you and you, so I said, mm. Not pronounced dirt, I said do. And Ax Ellis, my good buddy, went cha cha cha. Not in French. So then she said to Ax, you pronounce um. So I said mm. do. And I went cha cha cha. So she put both of us out and we had a condition in French. Because <laughs> when I went to Williams, I, I minored in French. Had great teachers in mathematics. Walter Smith, who became principal, who was a stern disciplinarian. We had, uh, or the, the, we had in English, and that of course was not my major subject, but one that I loved. I had Dr. Well, I had uh, Angelina Grimke, a poet, a beautiful lady, beautiful writer. I had uh, in English, Bertha McNeil was a section teacher, but did not teach me. Miss Atwood, and Dr. Riggs, who was an MD, but was teaching English <coughs> there. There were excellent teachers in the sciences, I'm sure Monty will cover that. 
E.B. Henderson was a wonderful inspirer and coach, teacher of physical education, and Tessa Lee was that for the women. We had great teachers there. We had great teachers. One of the most influential people was Johnny Wilkinson, J.F.N. Wilkinson, and that will take me to how I can get your father into this. J.F.N. Wilkinson was number two in tennis. Tyler Holmes, the teacher of Armstrong, was number one. We had tennis. We could play tennis. We played tennis at 13th and T, where the White Law Hotel now stands. The courts were there. Then they moved them over to Howard, where the annex to the old Freedmen's was. They had courts there. We had courts at the Lucretia Mott Playground. There I spent many a day doing what the kids today do much better, and that is dribbling a basketball and shooting. I would shoot baskets, but I did not forget to read a book, as so many of the kids in my block will do. Basketball was important, but tennis was, was quite a sport. And Wilkinson was a great influence. He taught manual training at Mott and looked out for all the kids in the neighborhood on the Mott School playground. Banneker came in across from Howard University and became a great place. We had then a separate tennis organization. And on the tennis court, I was friends with people like Allison Davis, John Dewey, Professor of Chicago, and Judge William Hasty. Bill Hasty was a perfectionist. Bill Hasty believed in the correct form. So Bill had this sweeping forehand, and he had this wonderful backhand. But he was so impressed with being the ballet star <laughs> that he hid over there, you know. And, and look at that form. In the meanwhile, somebody like Lip Langhorn had come in and tapped the ball over here. The point was over, but I mean, after all. <laughs> Bill was a great player. One of the great athletes was a man named after a great physicist, Newton. Newton Miller was a wonderful athlete. He was an young man I knew in high school and whom I admired. I used to walk fast down to M Street. And Newt died young, but Newton Miller, one of Keller Miller's children. He was a fine athlete. Gene Toomer was a fine basketball player. And he used to play at the twelve feet Y. They first played at the True Performance Hall and then the twelve feet Y was built there and we had a basketball tour. So we did have athletics. Did not have much baseball, we used to play baseball. But until, of course, Jackie Robinson, what we had was the occasional appearance of Negro teams, and they were first rate, Homestead Grays and the rest. And they had fine baseball, but in Washington we played more tennis and basketball, we played some baseball. At Howard University, I got about one second. Yeah, about two minutes. About two minutes. Well, I, I was at Howard University for uh, you know, from 1929 to 1979, that's 50 years, and so I can't do it in two minutes. Uh, I was there with the Young Turks, Ralph Bunch, E. Franklin Frazier, Harold Lewis, Sam Dawson, Rayford Logan, Percy Barnes. It was a great day to be alive. I have wonderful students. I have wonderful memories of how I served under that beloved, benevolent dictator, <coughs> Mordecai Johnson. <laughs> and the last anecdote is that Mordecai Johnson, we got a new chemistry building. And Franklin D. Roosevelt came up to do whatever, whatever you do to it. And he came up and his son pushed him there on the steps and he came in. And because of safety requirements, they, they cleared out the first part, but Franklin was not worried about it anything, and so Franklin Roosevelt mentioned to Hugley to fill up the seats. And Hugley said, eliminate the hiatus. <laughs> he was a professor of chemistry, but he had too much Latin at Harvard. <laughs> and so Zion Czech, a radical, Congressman from Washington made a speech and he said, at Howard University, you're praising your, your, your chemistry building, but he said, 
your chemistry building is not much. We've got many of them at the University of Washington better than that building. But he said, what you have here at Howard, I wish we had at the University of Washington, and that is freedom of speech. And Mordecai Johnson got up and said, as long as I am president of Howard, we're going to have freedom of speech. And Congressman Dawson got up and said that such a thing is too much freedom of speech and walked out. <laughs> and they reported Mordecai as a communist. And uh, so then we, the Young Turks, decided that his cause was our cause and we went to uh, support him. And this is the last tale. We went in to see some congressman in Michigan to his office. And he gave us a speech, and Ralph Bunch said, no, 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 we, we can't vote, Mr. Congressman. We, we're here on a matter of freedom of speech. And the congressman said, what about it? He said, Howard University. And this congressman said to his secretary, give me my file on Howard University. So she gives a little folder with about three items in there. One was on Joe Lewis winning the races in 1936 in Europe. One of them was on Joe Lewis. And the other one was on an ex-slave that died at the age of 171 or something like that. That was his file on Howard University. That's a little bit of a lie, but it ain't too far. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> well, now we'll, we'll, we'll get a little bit more from Dr. Brown when we move into the question and answer period. But now you're talking about chemistry, and that's a fitting move to go on to Dr. Kopp, who is probably one of the great legends of the medical and, as uh, Betty said, really all of the institutions at Howard University because he is a poet, a scholar, uh, as well as a physician, but the traditions of, of excellence at Howard University and the training ground it served, as that it served for black physicians throughout this country are in large part due to the work of Monty Khan. Yeah. <laughs> like Sterling, <clears throat> I was born in Washington 76 and a half years ago at 1326 T Street Northwest, a house which still stands, although it hasn't been uh, named uh, National Historical Site yet. <laughs> I was, uh, you might say, oriented prenatally to both medicine and uh, civil rights. Dr. A.M. Curtis had uh, delivered me in the home, and the year before I was born, on uh, a table in the back room he had performed major surgery on my grandmother for a prolapse of the uterus and <clears throat> I thought that was very wonderful when I heard about it because in those days Negro physicians did not have access to any of the hospitals. Friedman's was a very limited facility, and not for private patients. And so surgeons like Dr. Curtis <coughs> and uh, later the incomparable Dr. Simeon Carson formed their own teams. And they would have one assistant and an, an anesthetist and they did almost everything in the home. I can say at my advanced age that uh, all of the surgery that I've had has been <coughs> by how it graduates and nothing could have been done any better. The last major surgery I had was done by Dr. LaSalle, the fall, they had me open two hours and a half, but, uh, and nobody touched me that I hadn't caught. <laughs> Except one resident who, whom I didn't know, and he came in with a perfect bedside manner and sat down to chat. I said, look, doctor, are you going in with Dr. LaSalle tomorrow? 
You said yes. I said, well, look, you don't, I'm perfectly prepared. I know they think I might. There's a possibility of cancer, but they don't think so, but we've got to have it done. Now, will you draw me a diagram of the muscular layers of the abdominal wall? <laughs> <laughs> so when he brought me this diagram, I said, well, thank you very much, doctor. Now, when Dr. LaFall goes in, would you promise me you just hold a retractor? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I had to go to Dr. Curtis's office often, and I loved the smell of iodoform and these other things. I thought that that accounts for my being in medicine. Now, uh, my prenatal orientation to the NACP uh, began like this. Uh, the Reverend Francis J. Grimke, who was minister of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, married my parents and he christened me. And when I was five years old in 1909, the NACP was formed, and so we were right in there ever since. I didn't see Dr. Grimke until he was already a mature man. But the universal respect in which his congregation held him, although he read all his sermons, was such that a replacement was not named until he formally retired. As long as he was living, his successor was not the minister of the church. Now, I am deeply grateful to my parents because they didn't teach me to hate. If they had, I would have had to, as uh, Raven said about his military experience, exercise that. But there was a white school right behind my house and I could see the children playing. And then I saw what the early dwellings were like, which were in the place that L'Enfant had planned as a park. But after the Civil War, the early dwellings were up. And I wondered when I would go to school. And uh, my parents said, well, when you're four years old. And I thought I would go right there because it was near. But then at four, I was taken around to Patterson School. Uh, I asked why I was that. They didn't tell me that's because of white. They said, you will learn. I'm deeply grateful for that. I became objective. And uh, after a re recent visit to Republic of South Africa, we had a <coughs> uh, high caliber audience for this report. I said that all my life I had been like the chimpanzee whom the learning professor locked in a room and then looked at the keyhole to watch every act. But he couldn't see anything and finally realized that the ship had been looking back at him. And so, as I gradually learned these differentials about race, I've been looking back at the white man. And in my first 76 years, I hadn't seen anything to uh, be too much impressed about. Now, in kindergarten, I learned unconsciously, that quality in education depends on good teachers and eager students. All else is secondary. I believe there was a president of Williams College who said something to that effect, uh, Mark Hopkins, that a college was Mark Hopkins on one end of a bench and the student on the other. All else is secondary. Well, uh, in those days, in divisions 10 to 13, the color divisions, when a colored school got overcrowded, they built a portable. And Patterson School had two portables in the yard. So the only place they could get for the kindergarten was the basement of a Seventh-day Adventist church, which still stands on the northeast corner of 10th and B Street. But my memories of, of kindergarten are very pleasant. Uh, Miss Montgomery and Miss Williams loved the children. And we always had a good time. And as we went, in, uh, I had Miss Wormley in the first grade, Miss Eva Lucas the second grade, Miss Wade in the third grade, Miss Brown in the fourth grade, and a wonderful lady in the fifth grade, Miss Brooks. She was a short, sort of pyramidal-shaped lady, uh, 
and to compensate for her lack of stature, she had a long furu with knots on it. But she had radar. And if you would come in, and we were very expert at making and casting spitballs. And of course, uh, you would, <coughs> and the boy, oh, he would yell, you see. With unerring <laughs> accuracy, Miss Brooks could turn around, pick up this uh, ruler, and walk directly to the one who'd thrown it. Which hand did you throw it with? <laughs> Which hand? And then she would get your whack. Right. Miss Ross in the sixth grade, Miss uh, Talbot in the seventh grade, and Miss Katie Lewis in the eighth grade. Wonderful time. Now, we were fortunate in that living in Washington, uh, everything was here free. All you had to do was walk there and get it. And the boys with which I'm growing up, including your father in the eighth grade, Bill Aster came, joined us in the eighth grade, Miss Lewis's room. They came up from Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, we passed your old, the family homestead at 608 Q Street. It's still there. You better get that preserved as a historical site. <laughs> but we could go down to the museums. Uh, by the time I got to college, I knew all about dinosaurs. Uh, first time I heard a big time college band in uh, 1921 it was. It didn't sound anything extra, but uh, it was a long while before I realized that my ear had been attuned to the best in band music by the free open air concerts of the uh, Marine Band, the United States Army Band, the Navy Band, and the Soldiers Home Band. They were all competitive. Now another great influence, which was a piece of good fortune, was the 12th Street branch of the YMCA. That was now called the Anthony Boyne YMCA. Mm -hmm. It was opened in 1912. And they had a wonderful group of people there. When you hear about wanting to be bussed somewhere now, why, we would start hikes from the front of the 12th Street YMCA <coughs> and walk over to uh, the foot in Anacostia that has now been deplaced. There were 26 forts, like uh, Fort Stevens out on 13th Street. But there's one over at Anacostia we used to go. We'd uh, go way out in Rock Creek Park all the time, and that developed good legs and a fine group of men. Now, <clears throat> as Berling said, Dunbar was a wonderful experience. Uh, I'd just like to mention two who haven't been named. Clyde McDuffie uh, taught Latin. He never had a course in uh, uh, education in his life, but he was a born teacher. Uh, World War I was on, <clears throat> and Mac would come in and put the uh, uh, newspapers on the board showing the disposition of the Allied and German troops and spend some time talking about that and then uh, said, well, now let's uh, see how Caesar and Ariovistus fought it out on the same line. And then we'd read that. A curious thing, am I within time limit? Uh, we had to read Cicero in junior Latin, uh, junior year. And you, the first, third, and fourth orations were approved by the Board of Education, but the second oration was printed in the book but uh, that was not described, so we all translated it privately. Mac came in one day, let's do a little sight reading. And so he called on somebody and this stuff flowed. I said, wait a minute now, that sounds like somebody has read this before. And we had all, of course, all translated it privately. And uh, it says, why, O Catiline, you sit aside from the other senators with your head down. And we tried to do it in the elegant. I said, free that up. What's, what's this little saying? And finally he said, uh, well, uh, uh, where were you last night, Catiline? That's what he's saying. <laughs> where do you like the light that way? And uh, I had Mrs. Mary Hundley in uh, French. And to, uh, I didn't have but one year of French. Uh, 
but uh, the college said I had to get two. So Molly gave me a year of French in six weeks of summer school, and it was so good with her emphasizing me. <laughs> but I didn't get to France till uh, 54 and tried it out. Uh, then though I need said, uh, speak French. Uh. Now we had all sorts of things that were ridiculous. Uh, your uh, brother Newt was uh, very good when we opened the Francis swimming pools here. That's a very interesting story. After World War I, there's no bathing beach. So they built a white bathing beach on Tidal Basin. But uh, it proved impracticable to sterilize that. <laughs> so they were going to put a covered beach on the other side, but then they had to pick a site on the river. And no site on the river could be found except one for the covered beach would be further up the river, and so that water would wash down, you see. That <laughs> so they decided to put up a series of neighborhood swimming pools. And the first one was the Francis swimming pool out here. I was a junior in medicine then and uh, went for a job. But the papers announced that a man who was a teacher of uh, English or something up at Central High School had been made the superintendent. So Colonel West Hamilton and Mr. Beeson up at, uh, who ran Georgetown, went down to see Colonel Grant. And they said they didn't know where they could find anybody with experience like that to run a swimming pool. So uh, uh, they told him, you've got men hired as lifeguards who've had more experience than that. So I got to be made superintendent of the swimming pool. And I immediately hired uh, Charlie Drew, his brother, and uh, Pendleton up there, and later Pete Tyson as guards. And they wanted to come out to show how to run a meet. We put on the first first class swimming meet that Washington had ever seen because our crew had had more experience in these affairs than any of them knew anything about. And I believe Newt was the referee for our second year, and we ran those events just like that. And so they were asking us, where did you learn all that? And of course, you take it lightly in those days. Now, I can't uh, say any more than that... Uh, all of us got the seeds to try to, and a sense of continuum, because the people to whom we are indebted didn't get anything for it themselves. And so material wealth isn't anything. I think the three of us feel fortunate in being alive, and not you. I didn't say man, because you Include were much me. younger. <laughs> and so... Uh, What's the use of trying to uh, set up your treasures on earth and so forth? Because you might can't be here to enjoy it. Now, have I used up my time? Yes, you have used up your time. <laughs> now, thank you very much, <laughs> Dr. Carl. We'll move on to Dr. Logan, who is well known throughout the world. Uh, as one of the great uh, historians and I think he has probably uh, shared his knowledge and wealth with any number of universities across this country and, and even outside of our borders as well and we're very fortunate to have him here uh, to be with us this afternoon. Dr. Logan? I have been on the FBI list of suspected subversives for so many years they find it advisable to jot down most of the things that I'm going to say. <laughs> the greater Washington community is indebted to Mrs. Betty Terry and the sponsors of this colloquium <clears throat> for this program. Our nation's capital enjoys the reputation of being a city of magnificent distances. It is also a city of fascinating compromises and bargains. America's last colony has its roots 
in a bargain between Secretary Treasury Alexander Hamilton and Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson. Hamilton wanted the new federal city to be located in the north, Jefferson in the south. After a convivial supper, Hamilton promised that in return for Jefferson's support for federal assumption of state debts incurred during the American Revolution, he would support a site in the South. Bargains and compromises have been recurring themes in the shadow that still lingers. Less well known than a city of magnificent distances, less well known than a city of magnificent distances is that of a secret city in one of the best histories of our nation's capital. Constance McLaughlin Green wrote in The Secret City, A History of Race Relations in the Nation's Capital, quote, Indeed, at every period before mid-20th century, except possibly for a brief span of time in the early 1870s, colored Washington was psychologically a secret city, all but unknown to the white world round about. This conclusion in 1966 by a Pulitzer Prize winning historian is fortunately less valid in 1981. This colloquium, we hope, to make all Washington less a secret city and inspire additional studies about the falsely labored capital of the arsenal of democracy and capital of the free world. The little black background will help explain my views about our city. Three recollections of my boyhood days are relevant. Like Monty, I did not grow up hating white, white Americans partly because there was no segregation on the streetcars, especially because there was no segregation in the Library of Congress or in the public library. On the other hand, I remember very vividly congressmen who both that they came to Washington to fight liquor, L-I-K-K-E-R, <laughs> and niggers. Washington newspapers stereotyped all Negroes as big, burly Negroes, spelled with a lowercase n. Even if the accused was puny, he or she was still big and burly. <laughs> this description was, of course, vicious and designed to inflame, inflame public opinion. Readers of Washington newspapers today find it difficult to believe this fully documented accusation. But for years, especially since the so-called Black Revolution of the late 1960s, Washington newspapers have popularized another lie. It's so silly, stupid, factually and logically absurd that I do not understand its widespread acceptance. To cite one instance, during the last few days, newspapers have described a suspect in the latest killing of a Negro in Atlanta as a light complexion black man. <laughs> Recently, the black maniacs have popularized a new absurdity, blacks and Hispanics. Many Cubans, for example, are black Hispanics. These terminological aberrations, sanctified by general use, should remind us of a perceptive statement by George Orwell. In his book, Politics and the English Language, he wrote, quote, but if thought corrupts language, language can also corrupt thought. A bad usage can spread by tradition and imitation, even among people who should 